Thank you so much, Eli, and a huge thank you to all of you for joining us today. We are absolutely thrilled to be presenting live to you today. Thank you to everyone who watched our pre-tape session. We hope you enjoyed it. Now, it's no secret that your place of birth has a significant impact on how much access you have to health information and health care. For many born into low and middle income countries, this access is very limited and in, in some cases, non-existent. Our team, the Building Global Relationships Group, zeroed in on this issue of inequitable access to Parkinson's educational resources. We sought to address this issue by exploring ways in which we, the international Parkinson's community, could work together better to share our resources and best practices with each other to enrich and strengthen our community as a group, but with a particular focus on communities with limited access. Now, our approach was to first review and build on an existing survey that had been sent to WPC partner organizations. We expanded on this survey to help us broaden our understanding of what resources were available and or lacking within the community, who had these resources and who needed them. Our expanded survey also sought to identify what formats and languages these resources were available in and what formats and languages they were needed in. Identifying these target areas will set the foundation for building a centralized database of Parkinson's informational and educational resources. Having a centralized location for these resources greatly simplifies and improves our global Parkinson's community's access to them, thereby bridging parts of the gaps relating to inequitable access to these resources. We would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all the organizational partners who filled out the survey. The more data we have, the broader our understanding of what is available versus what is needed, the more efficiently we're able to address the, this issue. Thank you so much for your time. And now I'm going to hand it back to Tam, hand it over to Tammy. Great. Thanks so much for that, Amatola. And thanks everyone for joining us here today. Um, um, we're now going to be moving into breakout groups where you're going to have 20 minutes to dive into some really specific questions. Thank you for your participation. Um, we're going to have some time to get some feedback from just three of the groups now. I've got a question here for our audience. What was the one thing you think either you or your organization could do to move the needle in the equality stakes for people with Parkinson's in low to middle income countries? What is it that you think you could commit to today? Um, and while you're doing that, I just want to talk to one point that was brought up in um, one of the groups that we're not probably going to hear back from in this particular forum. But um, one of the things they had to say was, you know, when we talk about resources, it's not just about printed collateral or um, videos. It's also what about the human resources to help um, other organizations who are maybe just trying to get off the ground? How do we support them as a global community? to um, you know really thrive so if we already have the the business knowledge to get an organization running and we have successful organizations how are we going to share that um, with other countries and other communities where maybe they're just trying to get started so um, please just start to have a think about um, I guess from a global perspective if there's a way that you could contribute to that as well um, thank you. I can see that we've got our panelists back on stage, um, all three of them. So thank you for that. I think we've got, um, we'll go with Cynthia first. Um, if you could please share Cynthia with um, maybe a few quick comments, a few quick takeaways of what your group had to say. Absolutely. I'd be delighted to. And first of all, it was uh, wonderful to have all the groups. Thank you for the input. So many things coming out, but I'll, I'll pick on a couple that we talked about. One is the need for translation and getting materials into native languages and the challenges with that, not just uh, support materials, but we also talked about scales for research and validating them. And that while we can get them translated, having those uh, boots on the ground for somebody locally to also validate that it, that the dialect is correct, those words are correct, to make those materials very meaningful. Um, I think one other uh, thing we talked about was 
then how do we actually get these resources into people's hands? And, and this goes back, is this live on a website? And perhaps a website isn't the best way. And we talked about being creative with tools like Slack and WeChat and WhatsApp and how we know a lot of people in small communities may actually gather and communicate. And are there ways to utilize those tools for that eventual end user access that we can get out there? Um, one other point, and um, I have more, but I, I want the other speakers to talk, um, is the idea of building more alliances with allied health professionals globally and using allied health professionals as a way to get out and spread the word more. We know our allied health professionals probably spend more time with people with Parkinson's than physicians uh, are able to, and so educating them on basic resources in these um, low middle income underserved areas so that they can be a mouthpiece and a resource for us to, to help make these connections. So I'll stop there and uh, share the love with uh, my colleagues. <laughs> so back to me, um, I think next I'd like to invite Dr. Richard Walker, please. Richard, um, any key takeaways for you from your group? Yeah, no, uh, had a brilliant group, fantastic. There are lots of really good ideas. And, you know, following on from what Cynthia was saying, I mean, I think there was a, a general agreement that there's no point us all reinventing the wheel here and that there must be resources out there and we do need to translate them. But I think picking up on the, the idea of making sure that they're appropriate for the area and then thinking about, well, actually, you know, some people don't just want a, a document translated, but if they're illiterate or whatever, that may not be very much help to them. And so making sure that um, not only is it culturally appropriate, but it's actually appropriate for the people who are using the materials. Um, and also it was highlighted that, that actually a lot of people still don't have access to the internet. And so if you can get on the internet, you can get a lot of information, you can get a lot of misinformation. Um, but um, so, so having, there was one suggestion came through that we might have a, you know, a one pager, which is just literally uh, some basic information about Parkinson's and, uh, uh, for countries that could then be adapted for different countries. And I think the other other point I wanted to raise was that one of our uh, people suggested that actually, this is all very well having this information, but actually there's other support that's required and maybe we need to get graphic designers involved, et cetera, to see, to work with people and, and work out what sort of material they want and, and, and how best to work with them. But uh, no, really interesting discussion. So thanks to my group. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point when you talk about translation, sometimes it's not just taking the content verbatim and taking it from one language to another, it's also taking it in its cultural context from one culture to another. Um, and that can be quite a different process. Um, and now I'd like to invite um, Professor Ignacio Mata, please to feedback about your group's efforts. Thanks, Tammy. Yeah, uh, my group was awesome too. And uh, I, it's really cool to see that three different groups with different people came out with the same with the same topics. I, I think at least it gives us something to, to work with. Uh, we also talk about translations and uh, uh, we talked about maybe, you know, technology is getting really good. Uh, so I think you can use machine learning now to, to at least do a first uh, pad, pad of uh, the translation and then having local people to actually look through them and, and uh, adjust them for the, you know, culturally, uh, literature and all, all these uh, different things. I think that was a very good point. Um, we also heard about uh, people in Canada doing something similar just within the country. So I think we might be able to learn from some of these uh, initiatives and see how they're doing it, what kind of areas they have, and then see if we can use some of their knowledge to be able to uh, incorporate that into our project. Um, we also talked about the people that don't have internet. How do we uh, make sure that you know they they get access to this? Uh, or even people have internet. How do we how do we sell this? How do how do we make sure that people know it's there, right? Because if we build it but it's hiding, nobody's going to be able to find it. So I think uh, that was another topic that we uh, uh, talked about. Um, uh, Christine from Peru brought a very good point, which is the monitoring. Who who is going to make sure that the things that are there, you know, are, are right and and things like that. So yeah, so I think again, many, many things in common. I think uh, it gives us something to work in uh, at the at the group. So yeah, I really enjoy it, and I'm I'm really happy that uh, uh, you know we're doing this. And and uh, yeah, thank you so much for all the input. Thanks, Nacho, for that. Um, and thanks everybody for your participation. Um, 
that feedback is awesome and there are some really interesting questions that have been posed in the breakout groups um, and some previous questions that have come through to us. We've got rem remaining with us on stage the three um, speakers that you've just heard from and we're going to have a question and answer session um, and they're going to represent, that, represent us on behalf of the Building Global Relationships Group. Um, I do just want to introduce everybody properly though to you. Um, first of all, I just um, introduce Professor Ignacio Mata. He's the coordinator of the Latin American Research Consortium on the Genetics of Parkinson's at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Cynthia Fox, who's the CEO and co-founder of LSVT Global and Professor Richard Walker from the Northumbria NHS Trust in the UK and the ex-chair of the MDS African Task Force. So I'm going to start with you, Nacho, with a question that's already been posed. Um, in your experience, Nacho, what are the biggest needs in Latin America in terms of educational resources? Yeah, so so I, I think that there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there, as Richard was saying on the internet. So I think having a, a source of trust uh, information in Spanish, I think that that's, that's key. Uh, fortunately for us, you know, we have a lot of people in Spain, for example, a lot of groups that have a lot of information. So uh, Christine was mentioned that on the on the breakout session uh, that he she uses uh, a lot of uh, their resources that are already uh, available in Spanish. Uh, but that's not true for a lot of other different languages, right? So I, I think uh, we're lucky in that in that respect. But um, but yeah, I think just basic basic things about you know what Parkinson's is and what to expect and and those things are probably the most important uh, uh, to to begin with. And then obviously having access to you know videos that explain things about nutrition and therapy, you know, exercise and all those things. Uh, but 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 again, I think Spanish is common enough that, uh, uh, you know, we, we have more resources and I would like those resources to be translated to other uh, languages and be making available to other uh, regions in the, in the world. Thanks very much for that, Nacho. Um, so also, I think as well, another thing that sparked from me when you were talking is um, the kind of investment required, not just in producing the resources, but in supporting people to be able to use them properly. So it's the training of um, the people power um, like you said, you know, we can't, the internet's great, but sometimes nothing beats a real life person to help you through a struggle. And so being able to provide some additional training, I guess, around that, um, which is going to lead me on to my next question for Cynthia. So Cynthia, um, can you tell us at LSVT Global how you've been able to inform um, things like speech, physical and occupational therapists? about Parkinson's specific rehabilitation, such as um, LSVT loud and big, in low to middle income countries? We, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I've thought about this and um, some of it has been really, in some cases, reactive. We have people who are in these areas who are looking for information. And, you know, if they're reading the literature, they come across these programs. And so they reach out and we call them trailblazers. And they may be a therapist, a speech physical occupational therapist. They may be a person with Parkinson's. They may be a family member. And it's sort of that initial sometimes one-on-one -on -one communication that gets the ball rolling and they become sort of a champion. I, I, we need these kinds of therapies. And I'll speak from the perspective of the LSVT, but it can be any speech, physical, occupational therapies. There's, there's other ones out there that are there and have a Parkinson's specialty. Uh, sometimes it's been through universities and the students who are training in these programs can be a wonderful way because they're eager for information, they're fresh, they're energetic, and, you know, touching them at that point and inspiring them perhaps to take on Parkinson's as an area that they want to get engaged in is a, is a conduit to sort of spreading the word and getting out there. Um, and then we've had, you know, I think in other cases, uh, therapists who have come to the US, the UK, other places in Europe for training, and then go back home. And then they've learned about Parkinson specific techniques in these sort of uh, opportunities. All I can say is we need to do a better job um, of our database. Uh, I was 
looking up some um, information, you know, 2% of our certified clinicians in, in our case are from low to middle income countries. So we have 2% serving about 84% of the population and the other 98% serving about, you know, 16% of the population. And so I think all of us need to make set goals that now I have a number, 2%, and, you know, we need to decide as organizations that number needs to be 5% and it needs to be 5% in three years. And then we say we have to dedicate the money, the budget, and the time to make those kinds of changes. And I think those little niches of concentrated effort with uh, numerical goals and drives uh, may be one way to help us increase those in lower middle income countries having information, having these specialty trainings so they can filter out then and, and service people with Parkinson's. So we have time just for one more question. The time is flying by tonight. Um, and this one I'll post to Richard, um, who we haven't heard from yet. Um, so Richard, in your experience, um, having led the Africa Task Force for MDS, um, what were some of the challenges you faced to sharing resources in Africa, specifically human resources, if that was part of your um, brief? Okay, so, well, I think um, we came across challenges of trying to provide information for people. Um, uh, but there are huge challenges otherwise. So it, there was providing information, the more things we've been talking about up until now. But there was a lack of public knowledge. There, you know, people aren't aware of what Parkinson's is. It, it, it isn't, but it, that's not just among the general public. It's also among health professionals. Uh, and then the real uh, elephant in the room is actually, even if you get diagnosed, is can you afford to get treated for it? And 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 that is one of the really biggest challenges for for Parkinson's in lower middle income countries is that even if we raise awareness among health professionals. We raise a marriage with the population, we diagnose them, we raise expectations, and then we need to be able to provide affordable drug treatment. So I think that is the one biggest challenge. Well, there are many, many challenges, but so it just needs to be thought about in the bigger spectrum of things is that it's all very well providing people with information and such like, but we need to, there are other things that we need to address along with that. Thanks for that, Richard. Much appreciated. And thank you, thank you everybody um, who's participated in the plenary tonight. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Claudia Martinez for closing remarks. Thank you, Tammy. And yes, uh, it's time for us to say muchas gracias, uh, shukriya, asante. We would like to thank you for your attendance and participation in our live session today. And we know we, that you, like us, believe that enabling more equitable access to information and resources for people living with Parkinson's, their families and caregivers in low to middle income countries is a priority. Your feedback and comments today will help us move forward in developing ideas for a web-based resource and inter-country inter models of care. But we also know that it takes a village to make the big positive changes that we all would like to see. And in order to make them a reality, we need your help. So if you have funds, resources, or expertise in any of these areas, or if you have contacts who might be interested in supporting our efforts, we encourage you to please contact us. So you can email us directly uh, to clinical at parkinsons.org.nz. And finally, we want to thank the World Parkinson Coalition for providing this opportunity to connect as a global community and create avenues to work together to improve the quality of life of those living with Parkinson's in low to middle income countries. We look forward to seeing you at the World Parkinson's Congress 2022 in Barcelona. And next up, we have a presentation of a case study by Maria, Tash, and Helen on replicating a community-based model of care from India to Kenya. And this initiative gives an example of how we can work together to build global relationships and improve uh, you know, access to Parkinson's education and, uh, and resources 
in um, communities uh, in, low, in low to middle income countries. The session will start with a discussion between the presenters followed by questions and answers from the floor. I know they will love to hear your feedback about uh, the case study and answer any questions that you may have. So now I'm gonna hand it to Maria to get the session started. 